let me uh, let me bring up a um, couple of slides here. And, um, so welcome, and we're so glad you're all here. And those of you who are back, welcome back. Um, and I think I think I shared this with you last week, but essentially. Um, Community Works Institute is sponsoring this ongoing seminar series for the summer, and then we intend as well in the fall. Um, we just, you know, are very humbled by the, the amazing educators like Kristen Clary, who, you know, we're connected with through our collaborative, who, you know, have so much to offer you. So look for more to come. Um, the journal, this is a good chance to plug uh, Janice's article. Janice submitted an article a couple of weeks ago and it's published remind me of the title janice roughly uh, emerging opportunities in the value of nature education it's it's a great piece it really is a great piece and um and i think you'll enjoy it and you'll find it if you go to community works institute well and find magazine in the main menu or communityworksjournal.org um, so this is our last summer um, seminar and the summer institutes are coming up again july 27th to the 31st and then august 10th through the 14th the, the timing east and west is relatively similar um, 10 to 2 eastern time for the east and 10 to 2 pacific time for the west i think i've got that right you can check it out on the website and then look for notifications for uh, continuing seminars going into the fall and we're in the works with a institute as well. Um, so our main, our main purpose today is, is looking at this whole idea of disruption as opportunity. We've got Kristen Higgins Clarity here with us and she's an amazing educator from Savannah, Georgia. Um, and I want to do a couple of quick need to knows. If you lose your Zoom connection, just re-enter through the same link. You'll be able to do that very easily, and we are recording, and we'll make that available very shortly. Um, please use the speaker view, mute yourself when you're not speaking, and you can use the chat feature if you have any difficulties, and also to get to know each other a little bit better. Um, I'll try to work with, with Kristen to keep track of the chat. If, if you have questions as things go along, um, I'll try and, and pick that up without interrupting Kristen too much. And we'll loop back around to that, you know, if you have thoughts, comments, questions. And I think we've all introduced ourselves. So Kristen, um, just really pleased to have Kristen with us here today. Um, Kristen's the founder and executive director of the Nobis Project, um, based out of Savannah, but they do work around the country and internationally. Um, and they're basically focused on developing educators' uh, capacity and ability to, to foster reciprocal and meaningful community partnerships, culturally responsive classrooms, and promoting social justice um, through you know, an overall approach to global service learning, which is a really good mesh with, with our goals at CWI. And we're just pleased to be working with Kristen um, today and going forward. Uh, Kristen's got more than two decades of experience as an educator. She's been an administrator with community organized, or organizations, K-12, she teaches at Savannah State University, an historically black college um, in Savannah. And she's also been recognized as a national emerging scholar for K-12 service learning research by the National Service Learning Partnership. For those of you that are familiar with that organization, um, her, her background, she did her PhD in Quaker studies from the University of Birmingham in the UK. And we had an interesting conversation about Birmingham, which if you're not familiar with Birmingham, it's, it's a very industrial, historically industrial, working class city in the Midlands in England. And, um, and her focus was on synthesizing experiential ed, service learning, creative process theory, and global citizenship education. And like so many of you, that's how we find each other. We're, we're all about that nexus of all that represents. Um, she's also the founding member of two charter schools in uh, the Savannah area, uh, which is her current hometown. So today, Chris is gonna talk about disruption as opportunity. And I, I think a lot of us see it that way. Um, we're gonna have to work really hard to make it an opportunity because it certainly uh, is tripping up schools and teachers left and right, but there, there is an opportunity 
and you know, I'm based in Los Angeles at the moment, and schools here, LAUSD, one of the largest school districts in the country, and San Diego have now said that their public schools are going to virtual learning for the fall. And it's gonna be different around the country, and depending on where you are, and some places we're still figuring it out, but I think the emphasis on virtual experiences is, is huge because for all of the missing the personal connection physically that a lot of us have um, a need for that, we have this opportunity to connect with people that we never ever would have. And it's certainly been true with the conferences we've run since March. It's true working with, with Kristen here today and with all of you and the seminars and the Summer Institute's the partners we've been able to connect with the Smithsonian, Kuhn Hart Film Foundation and others. Uh, these partnerships would not have happened by any means in the same way, uh, at the same level, if we were physically present in Brooklyn or Los Angeles. So, you know, that's what opportunity means to me. And then there are huge equity issues, and I don't need to tell you all that, um, huge, huge equity issues, including for teachers. So, getting back to the opportunity. So, Kristen, um, that's my way of saying hi, and thanks for being here. We so appreciate your making the time to be here with us today. And I'll, I'll turn things over to you. Thank you. I, um, I just want to uh, learn a little bit from you more about what your teaching contexts are. And I haven't heard from Sarah or Sonnet yet about what your, your um, if you're in the classroom or not in the classroom. Uh, Sonnet, would you mind going first? Oh, don't forget to unmute yourself. Um, so I um, am a longtime museum educator. I've run um, museum programs in art museums, history museums, children's museums. Um, and for 10 years, I was the founding uh, director, co-director of a New York City public school, the New York City Museum School, uh, which was a sixth through 12th grade school where students spent a good portion of their time using the resources and the spaces of museums around New York City. And our faculty included, um, it was all about co-teaching, so it was uh, New York City Department of Education teachers and museum educators who were responsible for the learning of students. So, that's, and I'm right now uh, just an independent consultant, newly, uh, uh, let go from the Brooklyn Historical Society. Thank you. And Sarah, what's your context? Well, first of all, Sonnet has a job that I didn't know existed, but I wish I had known when I first started. I worked with a New York Historical Society and realized how amazing it was, and I wish I could just have done that. Um, I teach APUS history, um, and this year, and I run the community service program, and so this year is actually the first year where I get to de dedicate, in theory, half my time. Um, to community service, which we'll hope will be a little bit more community-based and service learning based versus we're in Newark Academy, we're outside of Newark, we used to be in Newark, so there's definitely white savior-like issues that we're trying to deal with. Um, so that's kind of where I stand. So I'm in and out of the classroom and I'm hoping I can help other, other educators that I work with as well. So just to quickly interrupt Sarah, for five years I was the Deputy Director of Engagement at the Newark Museum now Newark Museum of Art. So we didn't quite cross paths, but we might have. So. No, maybe we need to talk later. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, thank you. That just helps me gauge what um, age groups we're talking to. So most of you work with uh, high school age groups, although some uh, more on the elementary school uh, spectrum. And, and then of course with community engagement, sometimes that means you have your high school students working with your little ones. And, um, and I love hearing the non-traditional education opportunities that are out there. I think that as the restrictions have ensued on us um, within the way education in the U.S. is going, uh, those alternatives are so so uh, critical to it. Um, we have one more person joining us right now. Since we're still in introductions, let's um, yawn. Am I pronouncing your name correctly? We would love for you to uh, just introduce what your teaching context is, and we're just about to get started. Uh, hi, uh, I'm sorry I, uh, I'm late today. Uh, 
So I'm teaching Chinese at Duke, and I have been working with, uh, you know, uh, designing uh, service learning or community-based learning projects. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's good to see. Yeah, some of them are so familiar. <laughs> yeah, okay, nice to see you all. Welcome, thank you. At Duke University in Durham, yes? Yes. Yeah, I just um, finished with a Duke Engage intern with Novus um, this week. Oh, so we okay. Had, uh, which is a great engagement program that they have there. Um, well, let's get started. Uh, you haven't missed anything. We've just been kind of <laughs> connecting with one another. Yeah. It, that important part of our, our digital space right now. So I am going to share my screen for you guys. pop itself open here in a second. Um, so as a disruption, as opportunity. So I am one of those thinkers who has long shared that I, um, I really felt that it's critical. Well, my dream was that we um, stop US education for a year. We just take a year off and uh, get all the best minds to come up with a new idea of what uh, re-envision education, let's start from scratch. Uh, and not only educational minds, but lots of different um, thinkers at the same time. And that once we, uh, then we take all of the students and we put them in environmental education opportunities for the whole year. It's like, think about the, like, the power of that generation and uh, re-envisioning climate change. And then when the pandemic came, it was like, it's as if, the exactly what I had envisioned as a possibility was here at our footsteps, right? Um, but what I was experiencing often with the, um, with uh, when I was talking to educators is this absolute overwhelming uh, doom of, or maybe not doom, but overwhelmedness of how do I even see past whatever I'm doing tomorrow, right? And so that opportunity for us to sit and reflect and think about new possibility isn't there when we're in survival mode. And, um, and that becomes uh, very um, frustrating, I think, uh, for us, especially for any of us that might be um, uh, visionaries and, and ones that really like to think about uh, what's possible. Um, Joe has introduced a little bit about the Novus Project. I'm the, the founder of this um, organization. Our mission is to inspire purpose, pivot mindset, and activate agency. We work with educators, um, primarily K-12, but often higher ed too, and uh, thinking about the intersection of uh, needing a social justice lens if you're gonna do community engagement work. Um, and it all started back in England when I was doing my PhD, and I was really curious about, is it possible to do service learning without international travel, international service, without international travel? Seeing that the US is such a big player in global policy and so few people from the United States actually leave the country, um, what power could this have if students had a better understanding about our interdependence and uh, global connectedness? Um, so I created this service learning model. Uh, it's very similar to a traditional service learning model. And, uh, and then I tested it at, at Quaker schools. And I had great results. Um, the uh, so the model works that you have your students define what the problem is, and that can involve bringing community experts in or watching videos about problems, doing just investigative research. Um, and then they are challenged to design a response. And they have to, their, have to design something that's both creative, that it informs other people, and that it directly responds to whatever the problem at hand is. And then, the, then they carry out the action, right? And then they're documenting it as they go. And the documentation has two really values. One is for uh, assessment of their learning. But the other one is that what we know about best practices in service learning is that if you're able to have a longevity of an experience, it really enhances the quality of that experience. And as educators, especially in K-12, it's not always realistic for us to have a long-term repetitive project with the same community partner and the same group of students. But what we can do is develop a deep relationship as the educator. And then even though we're bringing different groups of students into this partnership over years, uh, we've seen the same kind of quality benefits. And that documentation is the opportunity to pass along to the next group of students what was learned 
so that you don't have to start from scratch and redo the project and that you can go deeper and deeper within a community problem and with your community partners. And then of course, reflection is the most critical piece of this and that's the first one to get dropped off. We'll talk more about reflection as we go on. Um, and so there's two things in this idea of disruption as opportunity related to our global action model. One is here's a model that allows you to do community engagement even if you're in the virtual context. Um, and part of the ways that it was so critical of its success was the group dynamic, the students working together, which they can do in virtual spaces, it's not ideal, but there are ways for them to, to collaborate. Um, and or to go off and um, do different pieces of the work and then bring it back together as a whole. And the other piece that made it really meaningful and them feeling like they had uh, made a contribution is the informing others. As we as educators know, the more that we teach something, the better of an expert we are of that content, the more we're able to really understand how it works. And so when they become teachers of whatever the, the systems are that they're trying to um, create change within, um, it definitely gives them a sense of empowerment um, of being the person who can inform others. And there's all kinds of digital virtual ways um, to be informing other people about what's going on in communities. Um, <clears throat> so great model. It works successfully in my Quaker school. So I founded the Novus Project and I start taking it out to other school groups. And what happens is immediately um, it starts to fail. <laughs> so I'm in the charter schools, I'm in other independent schools, I'm in public schools. Sometimes it's not having all of the same benefits. Um, and as we know with service learning, a real danger is um, reinforcing stereotypes or um, uh, you know, continuing and perpetuating a dominant narrative about a group, that white savior complex kind of comes in. So what I found was that I had to stop doing the service work unless I was setting a context. Uh, and one of the things that was really different was that the friend schools had a social justice context to how they um, interact in their community, um, both on and off campus. And so that foundation was already set. The students already had a vocabulary. So Novus holds our first think tank, and we develop uh, the Novus Big Ideas, which is a, um, a framework. Uh, there's five big ideas, and it's a framework to help uh, do that unpacking, both as an educator when you're planning out your experience, but then also um, within the project, when a, when a student comes to you with a question that they can't figure out how to answer, this is, for you, or you can't figure out how to answer, you go back to the big ideas as a, as a good starting point. Um, so today, I'm going to go over the, the big idea so that we can use it as a framework, and then I'm going to um, uh, introduce you to a number of different interactive activities, and then we will uh, try some of them out together as we're continuing our kind of thinking about what's possible in both nurturing relationships that we may have already established in our, our um, communities prior to um, to COVID and, and how are we continuing to, to nurture them and respond to them throughout this experience. And then also inside this disruption, what possibilities for new partnerships or new ways to engage um, could, could be out there. And then I think it would be great with these different levels of expertise that we have the wisdom in the room to, to share with one another and, and even brainstorm together. Um, so I'll make sure to leave time for that too. Um, any questions real quick? Before we get started, feel free to add them to the chat to if you have some as we're going along. So the first of the, fi the five big ideas, oh, I should let you know. So we have a free teaching resources is one of our, our big pieces of our mission. And so the, the big ideas and the global action model, there's a free ebook on our website that has all of this listed out in there and available to you. So history is the first big idea. Nobis defines this as a collection of various analysis and imaginative interpretations of the human experience that seek to explain how society has changed over time. Um, and uh, part of this, what we try to emphasize with history is that it's not static, it's always moving. And, and there's so many different lenses of, uh, that you could never possibly capture all of some particular experience. So right now I'm facilitating this, you are experiencing it all different places on the globe. And um, 
and we're we're in a, the same moment of time, but we're having very different experiences of, of COVID or of our time together right now. And so um, we can't expect when we read one person's account for it to actually portray everything that happened. Um, and then another piece of history is this idea of collective identity, where history provides individuals and communities with a sense of identity through their understanding of a shared past. In this way, history shapes how people identify and interact with one another, often in ways that we're not aware. The example I give is um, my um, uh, Irish descent, my grand, uh, great grandparents immigrated over and my grandparents would always talk about the potato famine and the, the family farm getting burnt down and this real hostility towards the British in particular, to the point that when it was time for me to go and tell them that I had gotten into grad school in England, that I was really nervous about telling my grandparents and what they might say. And my grandparents never lived in Ireland. This wasn't their actual lived experience, but it was passed on through generations of me having anxiety about my very Irish last name and going to England and whether or not I was going to, to be received in a, in a particular um, and so as educators, it's important to think about what are all the different collective identities that I belong to that are, have influenced how I interact in the world. And then what are the myriad of ones that my students belong to and how are they um, uh, manifesting uh, and, and creating conflict of understanding or difference of, of understanding and experience. And then all the third stakeholder in our community engagement this scenario is what are the collective identities of our community partners too? Uh, and leaving room for those conversations. The next big idea is power. As the social force, the degree of impact a person, institution, or system has in relationships to others' beliefs, behaviors, or values. Power is an overwhelming one. It's one of the hardest ones for us to, um, to, to face. And it's often where I find educators are the most uncomfortable, um, especially because it includes privilege, which is the next slide. Um, but one of the wonderful aspects of power is we usually think of power as power over, uh, that it's uh, oppression, that it's uh, negative, but power is also power with and power within. And for that student that you have who completely shuts down because they have such an empathetic response to, to learning about an injustice, this is the one for them, right? You show them through historical examples when people have worked together to make change or where individuals have found self-empowerment uh, to, to take really big risks or to big stands against uh, injustices. And then privilege is this unearned power, this piece of it, and it operates on our personal, interpersonal, cultural, and institutional levels, and it gives preferential treatment to one group while withholding it from another. And the crazy part of it is, is that it's often invisible to the one who's getting the preferential treatment, it's often invisible to them. This is their status quo. They have no understanding of how it could be differently. And, uh, and this is where Nobis, most of our work has been, how do we help educators um, build their confidence in talking about systems of oppression, race, power, um, all the different isms um, that are, are experienced in our culture. Uh, and our ebook is full of different activities. And I'm going to show you some of those examples today, too, of, of ways that you can introduce these ideas um, and experiential ways with your students prior to doing community engagement work. So the third big idea is relationships. And, and this is a lot of our focus today of thinking about um, how in this uh, time of disruption, what are opportunities for, um, for fostering new relationships and deepening existing relationships. Um, and the two key pieces that we want to think about with relationship building is listening, that when we're trying to understand the origins of a problem, the people most impacted by the problem are most likely to know the solution. There's this great TED talk called Shut Up and Listen. Uh, it's this Italian man talking about his time during NGO uh, work across the continent of Africa in his 20s. And he tells this example of when he's in Zambia and this very um, fertile area, uh, you know, rich soil, but they're not growing any of their own crops. And he's like, they don't have food security. This is horrible. We should help them. So they go and get seeds from Italy, which is weird in its own 
right? Because there's clearly going to be seats closer than Italy. And uh, they bring them over and they were trying to teach the locals to get the locals to help to, um, to plant them. They're not interested at all. So they pay them to help plant. Now they're feeling really good about themselves. We're giving them jobs and we're teaching them how to grow food. And, and then he's like, in Italy, the tomatoes are this big, but in Zambia, they're this big. And he's so excited. They're almost ready to be, um, to be harvested. And in the middle of the night, there's this loud ruckus come out in the morning and all the vegetables are gone, completely decimated. And the locals are walking around like nothing happened. And the Italians are kind of uh, uh, frantic. What happened? What happened? And the locals are like, well, it was the hippos. What do you mean it was the hippos? Uh, well, that's why we don't grow vegetables. Um, why didn't you ever tell us that? Because you never asked, right? So the people most impacted by the problem, most likely to know what the solution is, their solution was we need to figure out how to keep the hippos away, right? Um, but that doesn't happen until you build deep relationships of trust. And when we're working with um, other, like nonprofits, for instance, or museums, museums are notoriously bad at taking, and nonprofits in general, of um, not saying no when someone wants to help, right? Uh, but think of how many hours it takes a nonprofit to prepare for your group of students to come when they could be using their expertise uh, to, to do the work of their, their mission-centered work. Um, and then there's also possibly a power dynamic there too, right? So did you get the introduction to this nonprofit because one of your students' parents is the board of directors? Uh, does that, you know, executive director feel like they can tell you no, right? So, and, um, and then also think about as relationships, if I was to come into your home and ask you, what do you need help with? We've just met. What would you tell me? Uh, and then when we meet NGOs, uh, you know, and cold call them and say, hey, I want to, you know, bring my students and work with you, that's pretty much what we're saying, right? Like, where do you need help that small people can help you with? So, um, but if you were to develop uh, relationships over time, it takes a lot of trust and it takes showing up and it takes uh, being in different um, places of, of where that uh, community needs support. So some of my recommendations are, if you're partnering with a, a community that's in a different neighborhood than yours, then maybe start going to the grocery store in that community. So you might run into the different people. If there's a community meeting, then go to the community meeting, uh, especially if they're addressing an issue that's impacting your community partner. Um, that it's, a, it's, it's, it's not a one-off, it's about a long-term relationship. Um, and only through reciprocal community partners, partnerships can real meaningful change occur. And uh, reciprocity is, is a really difficult one to juggle as educators where we have the safety and the education of our students as our primary line of thinking and then our community partner as second. And what happens if you try to figure out if there's a way to find um, a balance where, where both people um, are getting their needs met? Um, and then the next, the fourth big idea is global citizenship here. It's both a combination of civic engagement. Sometimes I push against the service learning word choice as a, as a concept because in the word service, there's an inherent, I'm here to serve you kind of imbalance. Where civic engagement can say, you know, even our kindergartners have a, a role and responsibility within society. Um, and so if we have this role in society, then we, so global citizenship says, and we have an interdependence. We are interconnected and therefore, um, have to make choices that are considering uh, the domino effect um, of how this plays out. And then the last big idea is cultural responsiveness. And here, the, you know, our goal is how do we listen to people's thoughts, feelings, and experiences and perspectives without judgment, working that, that muscle of, uh, and then developing a respect for everyone. And my favorite piece of this is that cognitive dissonance. How do we help our students understand how to analytically process conflicting sets of information? Um, I call it the world peace um, big idea. If you could hold on to your ideology and then make space for a different ideology and then still coexist, um, we would have world peace. But that's kind of what we're going at with, with this big idea. So I'm gonna pause there and see if you guys have any Questions. If they come up later too, Christine, go for it. 
Sorry, I couldn't figure out where my raised hand was because I had too many things open. Um, so one of my questions, and you said it's worked with, so I'm somewhat familiar with Novus's work and I've worked with um, a couple of other, seen you present at other places. Um, but one of my questions is you worked with, like you said it worked really well with the friends community because they already have like, right, a, a system of social justice. So my question is like, how do you recommend going about creating that if it doesn't already exist? Like I think our institution is, already getting there and now has to, like we had an equity and inclusion summit. We've like many private schools were called out about how we're treating our, our students of color, specifically our black students, right? So we're in the process of that, but I'm interested in figuring out how to get that there because the thing I struggle with is I'm still a community service person and I don't like that term, right? At all. And I have problems with it. Um, but it's like taking that jump seems like you need that basis. So I don't yeah, know. it is. It's, it's like true. a big question. So you don't have to answer all of it, but. Um, <laughs> I, I was happy to talk offline too in more detail. Um, I do a lot of uh, consulting or quiet conversations with educators because one of the biggest ways is how do you get your administration to support it? It's not you. And that's actually exactly the same. If, if you want change in your community, no matter what your community is, if it's your city or your state or your United States, um, change happens with policy change. Mm -hmm. That's the only time it really um, has enough meat to make a difference, right? It's why we look to the Supreme Court. It's why we look for laws that are in place. And it's why we sit to, met, to, to moderate them because um, changing human behavior is, uh, is not the role, right? Like we're not going to convince everybody to think differently, but we can set policies and rules in place. So then it becomes, how do I get my administrators to support the change? And my, the two things that I do first is um, if you're an independent school, go to look at your mission and how does whatever you want it to change to fit your mission, because that's what they're looking at. And then second, what are the other driving factors for your institution? So if it's enrollment, if it's college admission, then go to those offices and find out if we made this change, does it make us more marketable? Um, and that's uh, uh, a, you know, a distinct way of, of exactly how to move the needle, right? Because you have to think like an administrator in that regard. That's um, what I'm doing. That yeah. interesting that you're like, I tried it and then we, and then it didn't work when I like moved it out. And then obviously you've found us a solution to that problem. But So in terms of um, what does it look like in the class? So say I get approval, right? That, you know, um, how do you do this work well? And that also is tricky, right? Because if you come over and you say, hey, whole school, we're going to have this social justice framework and you haven't hired for that, you know, like you're just asking all of your, it's the same principle of like, everybody's going to do service learning now and not everybody is going to be great at service learning. That's not a great move either. Um, so a little bit of the next um, slides actually are very practical ways that I could think about embedding this into my classroom, no matter if I'm feeling uh, very savvy at this, or I just want to start it a little bit. And then one of the first things that we want to do is start with self. So whenever we're doing community engagement work, we're often uh, reaching over into otherization as quickly as possible. And that's a danger, right? Because it's very easy. And you know, I so often see independent schools in particular doing international global travel programs instead of working with their community that's you know, in the east side of town. Um, because it's much easier to talk about race and difference when it's in another country than it is to talk about it here in the United States. And in the last four months, we've seen how what throwback that has caused, right? Because we haven't been having these conversations. The first place to start is with self. And um, uh, here are just a couple of activity ideas and all of these can be done in a virtual space. So uh, writing a letter to your future, future self. So if you have a specific topic that you're looking at within your community engagement project, or you know, you're examining frogs, or you know, whatever it is, and you're thinking about the environment, or um, you're uh, about to um, do a, a thematic reading in a certain area, or cover a certain piece of history, you know, framing some queries for the students, but having them write a letter to their future self about what they're expecting to get out of an experience um, helps them outline what their uh, bias are, right? They're gonna, you know, uh, what do I think is gonna happen? Do I think I'm gonna feel good after volunteering? Or um, do I think I'm gonna see poor people? You know, it's amazing kind of what, and these can be um, written so that you can read them or they could just be written for themselves and then, and, and privately sealed and resent to them later. 
Um, but that process of writing and then having a conversation together about what the process of writing was like or what people included will allow students to have um, processed before sharing. Um, timelines is another activity and here I take up a piece of paper and um, draw a timeline, you know, horizontally across the page and then we make marks for each year of their life. For us, we make mark for like five years or 10 year of life, you know, you're depending on your age group. Um, and then I have uh, these th three different questions that I ask, like, what's your first memory of, you know, race or class or, um, uh, you know, noticing difference of ability? And then um, what's a time when you um, were either benefited from it or were um, oppressed by uh, a situation of race or classism? And then the third one is, is there a time you ever took a stance against it? And what they do is they just mark on um, like a couple words to help them remember what the memory is. And then we pair share and they share about whatever they're comfortable sharing about what was on their, their sheet. And then we come back and talk about our first experiences or any experiences of, um, of thinking about these different issues. And you would pick the racism, classism, ableism, based off of whatever the community partnership, you know, whatever the, the theme or the, um, type of experience they're likely to come in contact with. Um, the story of my name, one I'm gonna model for you here in a minute. And, um, and then the backpack exercise, uh, you're thinking about if you were to travel to a new place and meet someone who you've never met, what three items would you put in your backpack um, to, to represent parts of your identity? It could be very tangible, like I put a soccer ball in there because I play soccer, or it could be like I put a smooth stone in there because I'm really like grounded, you know, it could be metaphorical. Um, and in the virtual space, what's kind of cool about this is that they might have those objects right there at home, um, things that they might not actually have been able to, to, to bring to school. Um, and it's just a, a process of thinking about that cultural identity. Um, uh, and then we ask questions going back to the big ideas you know where do you see global citizenship in the different objects you picked where do you see power in the different objects that you picked and it allows at the upper level ages um, them to kind of unpack uh those the the big ideas too um joe i'm wondering if we could split into some breakout groups in pairs here in a second i'm going to give some instructions first uh, let me know if that's possible. So, um, sure. great. So the story of my name exercise is that you will share with one another the history of our name. Um, if there are any of our social identities are reflected in our name, like gender or ethnicity, teacher presumptions based off of our name, discriminated because of our name, privileged. Um, did you ever change your name? And it can be any of your names. It could be a nickname, your, your first, middle, middle, last, last, whichever you'd like to share about. And then we'll each share for um, two minutes. Uh, but one of the important things is that you, um, that you don't interrupt the other person. So this exercise is just about practicing what does it mean to really listen. And we're gonna give each other each uh, two full minutes without um, interrupting. And we're just gonna show them with our body language that we're listening to them. Um, and not interrupt for clarifying questions. One of the, you know, there's a whole idea of active listening, which I'm sure all of you have done some PD on at some point. It's like code for, think about whatever question you're gonna ask them next and you haven't actually listened to them. <laughs> Sometimes it, it backfires with us, so. Um, so Joe, if you wanna just pop us into um, two breakout groups, yes. and then if you put the timer on for like a two minute warning, then as soon as the two minute warning comes, it means it's time for you to switch to your other. Um... Are you that savvy, Joe? Oh, I think so. We'll see, we'll see. And if not, um, one of you can uh, take, um, watch the clock and uh, put it time. They will start to go. Okay, sounds great. Welcome back, I hope everybody got enough time to share. Um, let's uh, remember to unmute yourself, but let's just take a moment to um, share what that experience was like for you, being a listener or a sharer. So 
Um, oh, go ahead, Sonnet. I was just going to say, it was just really a fun way to get to know somebody else and you found out about their family, their background, kids, um, you know, just, and, and their profession. I mean, it just was an opportunity to, uh, a lot of stuff got hung on those very simple questions about your name. And I was going to say that what I really appreciated was just this moment in time where my only agenda was to hear what Jan was saying. I wasn't trying to take any notes or remember anything or it didn't relate to a lesson I had to teach or something I'm worried about with my kids. It was such a beautiful freeing moment to just literally have no goal but to experience another person. It was really cool. And also I feel like a, it's kind of like instantly I can connect with the other person that I don't know uh, and uh, kind of connect, uh, you know, uh, her, herself and also her life. I mean, which made me feel like, a, you know, uh, it, it's kind of like a sweet feeling. You know, you suddenly get connected with somebody else that you don't know. Yeah. Did any of you see the big ideas in your stories? power, history, global citizenship, cultural responsiveness, global citizenship. Um, it was interesting for Sonnet and I, we both have aspects of our name that, that maybe don't seem like, they, that, like we talked about our full names, our last and our first name or our middle and our last name. And like, it was very interesting to see the power dynamics and how they change when you add in my maiden name is Jira Puto. So that kind of changes the situation from Sarah or my middle name and the same kind of thing. So it's interesting to see that even though our backgrounds are very different and what that power looks like is very different, there was still some similarity about, about that kind of piece of it. Yeah. One and, thing. And, Go yeah. Ahead. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. In terms of a global, uh, I mean, cultural, uh, competence or global competence. I think uh, in my case, uh, in China, we, uh, our last name actually put at the beginning at first. So it's a, the, the order is kind of re reverse. And also uh, in Chinese, our names uh, are spelled like uh, in characters. So characters have, uh, has meanings. My uh, first name, Yan, actually combine, uh, is composed of two independent characters together, mean, meaning, colorf uh, meaning colorful, you know, a lot of colors, colorful. The reason why my father gave me that name is because they had a, a son first, and then me as a daughter. So he thinks, you know, life is so beautiful, so colorful. And also this Yan uh, has, uh, it's a typical girl's name, so that's why he gave me that name. So I think this is different from uh, maybe from English names. I mean, the in terms of the order and meaning, yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other big ideas, examples? History, power, relationships, global citizenship, cultural uh, responsiveness. I, I can share. My my original or my maiden name is Schultz, and I know not a lot about my family history, but I do know that my grandparents, my dad's parents, emigrated from a very small village in Russia uh, in the early 1900s, and during World War, just during the the Nazi occupation and and the time of uh, concentration camps that my all of that family was killed and there is nothing left so the only family that I really have is the ones that came over to the United States so that's all part of my maiden name family history just be yeah, that part of that collective identity is it already embedded in your name um so this exercise is um amazingly so i've had you know it's actually great to do with your staff for that matter too right because you can have worked with someone forever and not know these little different pieces about about their background and, and ways that they um have lived in the world 
I think it's great for educators, especially if you think about ways that um, maybe teachers mispronounce your name or I, I um, Kristen was pretty popular when I was younger. So there was always like a Christy or a Kristen also in my class. And there was one grade, fifth grade, where the other Christy, that's what I went by when I was little, was um, the teacher pet. And so my name was being called all the time, but it was never for me. Uh, and it just, so it made me notice that, right? So thinking about names too, as an educator, thinking about how, um, uh, how our bias might uh, lend themselves into our, our teaching and reveal themselves. Um, I also have a, an auditory processing disorder, so it's very hard for me to m remember new sounds. And, um, and I teach at a historically black school, which means that a lot of my, uh, my students have very simple last names often, uh, the ones that are from the United States, like Smith and Jones and um, uh, Richards, et cetera. But their first names are often spelled in really unique ways and with uh, uh, interesting different combinations. And so I was leaning on calling them by their last names, which were sounds that I knew instead of calling them by their first names, partly because I didn't want to get it wrong. But then I also realized that um, uh, their last name is uh, often reflected by who owned their family previously. And that their first name was where their family was giving their, um, their own uh, authentic touch to their, to their identity, right? And so here I was choosing the easier option instead of choosing the one that, um, where, where their parents had chosen to have power. And so, um, and there's lots of different layers to how you can unpack. Um, and one thing I, I just will preface, especially if you have mostly homogeneous classrooms and some students of color or, or uh, have different differences that they bring to the classroom is um, starting with self is really important. You also need to uh, do activities to create the safe space ahead of time because uh, you don't want to create the dynamic where the only person of um, of color is, is, you know, the timeline is a good example of this. So the, um, if you have a primarily white students and they're thinking about race and now they're, you know, the first time that they realized it was something and then they listen to their peer stories where they knew it so much younger or they knew it by uh, um, something that was far more, more dangerous or pressing, um, it can be uh, a very jarring experience of making sure that that experience uh, is safe for that student to be able to share. Um, and sometimes talking about self, especially if we're in independent schools where you might have big financial discrepancies, uh, that that could be uh, revealed in a way that a student doesn't want it to be revealed. And so thinking very thoughtfully about those dynamics when you're, you're crafting these activities um, <clears throat> is something to keep in mind. Do you have any questions? I'm gonna go on, continue to show what happens after we think about self. Yeah, go ahead. I, I have a question. I was interesting. It was interesting to, me, interesting to me that Kathy said, you know, I had no other responsibility than to just sort of listen and pay attention. But I actually felt very responsible about hearing Sarah's story and making sure that I, you know, that I, so I, I mean, I'm not disagreeing with Kathy, but there was a responsibility in getting to know another person's story that I also felt, um, I, I don't want to say burden, but I, I felt responsible for, yes. for paying attention. So just was interesting juxtaposition of words for me. Thank you. I like to see that, that variety of how we're experiencing the same moment. Um, and I think it also speaks to, uh, and this activity is really good for modeling with our students about what does it mean to be with our community partners and how do we create space? Because we'll, sometimes, like me, I'm a problem solver. I come in and I see the problem and I'm like, okay, here's all the ways that we fix it, right? Um, versus uh, thinking about the wisdom that's in the room. And, and um, did any, you know, I often do this for three minutes and three minutes. And sometimes I find that people felt like I had a follow-up question I wanted to ask, but it got answered because I left enough room, enough time. And so that is another good revealing thing that um, when we let them carry on. Sarah, did you want to add something? Um, I was just wondering, so um, I've been reading Bell Hooks as part of the like 4,000 books. Apparently, we all decided that that was what we're going to do for training this summer and read 4 million books. Um, but I'm reading Teaching to Transgress, which I've read parts of before. But one of the things that strikes me and that I do all the time, and it's nice to have some like 
chutzpah behind it now, I guess, um, is like how much, and I'm interested for others, like how much do you share about yourself? Like I often, that's how I create a safe space a lot of times is I try to model and do that first and like be real honest about, you know, we were talking about my name, my family's English and we, there's like a bad history in India, like recently um, over over there. And we, t and we talk about that. And I have a lot of Indian students in my class. So that I often share that like up front when we're talking about these types of things or whatever it is. And I'm just always interested to see how much, like where that, what that looks like for other educators. Cause I tend to overshare generally about my life all yeah. the time anyway. So <laughs> um, I'm happy to share my perspective, but we haven't heard from Janice and Cynthia and Jackie of late. Do any of you feel inclined to share on that or others? The answer is no. Huh. I'm so also I, quicker, so I can go for really long periods of silence. <laughs> I'm more than happy to share, but I missed what specifically we were sharing on. I apologize. Oh, just like, in classroom, do you share about yourself with your students? Oh, absolutely. Yes, I'm very much an open book. I. It's actually hard for me if I have something that I don't think I should share, like something. Yeah, I. They totally know everything about me. Um, cause I think that unless you have that kind of, and, and we're really fortunate. We're a friend school. I have the most amount of kids in any of my classes is 15. So that's, you know, we're really lucky with that. So we really do get to build very meaningful relationships with the students. We're allowed to choose whatever texts we want to teach. So we can really choose texts that can delve deep into the sort of issues that we're dealing with. Um, and yeah, so like I'm a first, you know, I came over to come to college here from Ireland and the first story I teach my 10th graders each year is, a, you know, a story about a girl who came on foot to the US from South America. And, you know, so we're talking about stereotypes of immigrants and all the rest of it. And, you know, when I'm telling them this, you know, and they're like, well, immigrants this and I, you know, I, I get them to say all those things that they think about immigrants and we just put them down it's no judgment like what what comes to your mind and there's lots of things that are obviously very offensive and they're stereotypes and they come largely from a place of of ignorance or unawareness on the part of the students but i'm like but do you realize you're saying that about me too and like well you're not an immigrant i'm like no like I am, my name affords me the privilege that you're thinking I'm just one of, you know, a homogenous white group. And we do have a pretty nice um, amount of diversity in our school. So it's by no, by no means um, a bunch of sort of white middle class kids. It's, it's a really nice diversity, but it kind of feels like then when you share about yourself that you give those other students the ability if they choose to, to also be able to share their story. Um, I go on to teach the hate you give and the black students just share so candidly about their experience being so very different from the white students in the class. So yeah, I think sharing about myself personally is really important if I want them to be able to do that too. I think what Jackie's points out and it gets to, um, goes back to your bell hooks kind of component is that, um, as uh, all of, uh, when you have so many privileges in your bucket, it is easier to share. You're less vulnerable from administrative pushback, parent pushback, et cetera. And so if I don't have all those privileges, this would be a very different story. So I am, I, you know, I have, I have educational privilege, I have economic privilege, I have white privilege, I have um, so many that are working for me. So sharing about myself, even in a historically black community, I still have the privilege that outweighs it. Um, and, uh, but I, for my, I, I think the conversation might be different for, for faculty of color and then also depending on their teaching context. And, um, but it, you know, when you, we have that luxury, it is an amazing tool to connect with youth. Um, Thank you guys. Always helpful to hear. I actually think it might be reverse in my school because I think our mostly white male administrators are scared to say anything that might offend any teacher of color. So they can push a little bit harder and share a little bit more. And, and then white teachers, which is the vast majority, right, um, are kind of, they are, they're more comfortable talking to and 
having a conversation about. So it's, it's interesting to see how those power, power dynamics play out. I mean, that's changing in my school recently, yeah. but it's just interesting to see how that plays out. So thank you guys. I, I also think it's really important to share my anti-racism journey and well, where I failed. Right. And I, I think that's especially important modeling for other white people on that journey. Um, uh, my favorite story, I was teaching ethics is um, middle, upper level college students. And um, I went to the white privilege conference and I was away for a couple of days in class. And I told them that I was going and their jaws dropped. I mean, I think they thought I was going to a, a white um, uh um, supremacy. Supremacy rally, right? So, and so then I introduced them to, you know, what we did there and what the, the premise was. And they were like, well, we knew that it was a thing. I just didn't know how to name, right? Like that there was this packaged way of thinking about it. And, um, so, so yeah. Kristen, can I yeah. just put in the chat, you mentioned the, the experience you had with your students um, and understanding sort of how their names, you know, can you just talk about how that got revealed to you? It, um, not by my students, okay. by um, my community partners. So I do a lot of work in Savannah. We have a program on um, race power and the preservation of African-American and Gullah Geechee history. And so I've become much closer to my community partners. And, um, and they were, I, I was sharing about the story of my name activity and they were like, oh, have you thought about it in this lens? Well, thanks. Mm -hmm. well, I'm going to go back to sharing my screen and continue to give you some more tools. Um, so we started with uh, activities for inspiring purpose. So how, what is my relationship in the world and, um, and how can I be a contributing factor to this? And so the next set of activities are thinking about pivoting mindset. Started with self, thinking about uh, place my role and now i'm starting to want to um, help my students see the world differently through different lenses and <clears throat> so this is when we would introduce activities that more um thoroughly and delve into systems uh reflection so we have this activity this power privilege continuum where we have all these different cards and they have different words like upper class lower class good schools um uh, access to water, and then it, using a, a math um, XY axis of more power on the bottom or less power and more privilege or less privilege, we start to identify where these cards are in relationship to power and privilege. Um, and these, this game is a great activity for inspiring conversation and how our different lenses or experiences changes whether or not we think it has more power or privilege. Um, single parent family is my favorite one. So sometimes students who have a single parent will see that their, their parent goes, has this amazing amount of power because they see them overcoming things so much that, that makes them seem powerful where someone else might see them um, who's not a single parent or, or maybe is, but see them in relationship to others. And so it changes whether or not they think that they have power. And it's just a great conversation builder you can keep it on the wall and add words as different experiences are happening um, throughout your community engagement projects. Um, dominant narratives, introducing and unpacking dominant narratives. Well, I'm gonna show you an example of that in a moment. Um, and even soundscapes, this is great for your, your younger students, although it works wonderfully for your older ones too. Um, if you want to, um, it's a, a theater activity where you create sound together. Maybe you went to camp and you did the ones where you like snap and then you clap your hands and you make it sound like it's raining. Um, but you could do it with different t time periods or places or historical moments in time where the teacher acts as the orchestra for all of the different sounds of what might be happening in a particular experience um, to give students the feeling of being in that that place. Oh, and this could be done virtually too, even, um, uh, you know, giving every kid, you know, group one, do this, and then you hold up a sign and they know what they're, they're supposed to do of getting louder or softer. Um, and then within the, kind of back to our theme of disruption, uh, one of the things that the pandemic has done has exposed all of these different systems and their vulnerabilities and their, the ways that they're broken and not serving all of the population. It's from public transportation and food supply, healthcare, poverty. Uh, there's an amazing amount of opportunity to think about 
how the big ideas, how existing relationships with community partners might factor in here. Um, uh, or, or even, it, it may be that you work with an existing partner that's a museum, but that museum has a piece of history that they don't usually tell, but actually is part of its narrative and they know about it, that has to do with um, food supply for the, you know, maybe it's a historical museum uh, that hits a certain time period when there also was a, uh, a food supply uh, dynamic change during the war or something, right? So uh, opportunities to, to think and expand there. Um, and one thing I wanna say while I'm here before I forget is, um, it's so critical if you have community partnerships that you've established that you check in with them during this time even if there's no way your students are going to be able to participate with them, you maintaining that contact and relationship is fundamental. Um, I remember going to a museum conference and they were talking about um, when you're in a recession, not to ignore your donors who can't give. Because uh, if you don't write them off when they're able to give and you continue to keep them a part of your community, even when they're not giving, um, they will come back in full force. Uh, but it's because it's about relationship. And so if you have established any relationships, checking in with them, because the likelihood of they are uh, serving communities, they are, you know, um, just like you at their wits end of the volume of need that's going on right now and, and what's being demanded of them. So a, a, a sympathetic or just a lifeline of, of hello and thinking of you will go a tremendous way during this time. Um, here is a, this is a free online software where you can with groups um, do brainstorming. So if you're thinking about uh, food shortage or poverty and you can think about the different players that are involved and have the students collaboratively in a virtual setting um, identify their different thinkings. The name of the this one is Coggle. There's tons of different ones online. <clears throat> and um, so here is another exercise that we do talking about um, dominant narratives and our, yeah, our definition. It's an explanation or story that's told in service of the dominant social group's interests and ideologies. Um, it achieves its dominance through repetition, the apparent authority of the speaker, and the silencing of alternative accounts. And I'm gonna do a full warning that often teachers are very complicit in number two and number one, right? So um, let me give you an example, is Rosa Parks. In, um, uh, what, if you would un unmute yourselves and share, what are some of the dominant narratives of how the story of Rosa Parks is told? She, this is like was, Jackie's um, immigration brainstorming. <laughs> Doesn't have to be your thinking. I think people feel that Rosa Parks was a, a doing this on her own. She just decided to, to refuse one day on the bus and they don't understand that there was a, a great deal of planning and organizing around it. People often see her too as like a poor little old lady who had to sit down and she was like actually a badass, which we talk about in my class. I don't use that terminology, but well, maybe I do, but, <laughs> but I think that's part of that dominant narrative. And yeah, she was tired, a, a long day. She just was fed up and she sat down. And then in, in reality, uh, she was not the first American, African-American woman to be arrested for refusing to yield her, her seat. There was one, I think just months prior, but that woman was a, um, had a child out of wedlock as they would put it at the time. And um, so wasn't a good icon for the movement. She was already very active in the civil rights um, movement uh, and being trained, et cetera, um, highly respected. And she wasn't even sitting in a whites only section. So on the bus at the time, there was like a, a section where you were supposed to move if the other sections were full. Um, and she, she just refused to move because she was already there first. Um, and it wasn't because her feet were tired. So, uh, but then the, the real question is, um, and this is what's such a useful tool of helping our students unpack, you know, Sure, the story was told wrong, but why? Like, how does telling the story wrong serve other groups of people? 
Um, and so some of the, these are just example questions, like how have you heard this repeated and what was the context? Um, and then how does it benefit the social group? How does it impact you? How have you benefited from it? Or does it harm you? Um, have you participated or resisted these narratives? And then kind of, you know, thinking bigger, what are alternative or mar marginalized narratives and how do they get si silenced out? One of our community partners in Savannah is a, um, a house museum from the, and they tell the story of the house from the 1920s where there were at least eight enslaved people who lived in the house. And um, they haven't till recently really told that story very much. It's not central. The space where they would, the enslaved would have lived is like the gift shop and the offices, right? So they've made a big commitment and um, have been fundraising to, to, uh, to renovate that space and to more fully enclose the story and, and to do a lot of research on the, um, the, all of the persons who lived in the house. Um, well, one thing that was very fascinating was the resistance of the, um, of the historians involved in telling um, stories that you couldn't prove in fact, like they weren't written down and documented. Mm -hmm. And so part of dominant narrative also in that kind of apparent authority is that we have this, this Western idea of it has to be published and vetted and, you know, and only if it was preserved in this way, then is it legitimate? Whereas in the African cultures, there is the oral tradition, which passed on for centuries, that's being invalidated by that um, pretext. Um, and there was a, a, a system in place to try to prevent people from being able to write uh, and, and therefore capture their stories. And so, uh, you know, there's this double whammy coming at you of how are you ever gonna tell these stories if you're keeping this very narrow thing about what gives authority to be able to tell the story. Um, and they did a, a brilliant job of working through that, of finding other um, research from the time period or, you know, b building and broadening how, how they um, were responsibly, you know, keeping their historian hat on, but then opening what that definition could be like. Kristen, there are a lot of historical societies also that are doing um, that kind of research with Native American um, uh, groups who are indigenous to a particular area and sort of countering the settlers story so you know while you don't have as you're saying written you know journals there are other kinds of records and, and stories that have been passed down um, and so Brooklyn Historical Society we included actually oral histories from a current Lenape leader talking about the, you know, the interaction and the intersection between the settlers and the Lenape. Um, and of course there was no oral history then, but there were people who passed stories in. That's great example. Also I think about what a rich community engagement project that would be too, <laughs> for your students to- Could I add to that? Please. So I was thinking the same thing about indigenous peoples and then also um, about people who've been not just sex trafficked but um, have been um, undergone any sort of sexual assault which is an incredibly underreported crime um, and only 89 percent of the ones that have been reported um, sorry 89 percent of the of the um, sexual assaults that have been reported absolutely nothing happens whatsoever with it so I'm just thinking so much of this really applies to that too, which is. Yeah, yes. I, it, one, the theme of our Savannah program, the underlying current is this, who has the power to tell the story? And, um, and, and that was uh, even apparent back in the, the service learning uh, model that we do, right? So when you're doing the define of what the problem is and you're collecting information, really pointing students to critically evaluate where who has the lens of being able to tell this story. Um, Ahmad Avery, the jogger gentleman who was uh, murdered while jogging is about an hour south of here in Savannah. And he is a Sapelo Island descendant. That's the Gullah Geechee community that Novus Project partners with. So he's the cousin of our facilitator, of Novus facilitator of that program. And um, I watched as Jazz single-handedly for months tried to get national attention 
to the story because it was published in the newspaper right away locally with incredible bias slant. And, you know, he, he wrote an op-ed and couldn't get it in the local paper. And, um, and what was fascinating is Sapelo Island is, um, uh, New York Times loves to write about Sapelo Island. They get a lot of coverage. And so Jazz knew the people who had written about the island in the past. And he used that power in order to, to get to a writer to write about it now. And um, without that access, the story wouldn't have ever kind of uh, broken and made the, the level of scrutiny that was required to get um, the Georgia Bureau of Investigation to jump in and, and kind of correct the trajectory that the case was going. Um, so this idea of power to tell the story and, and, um, and who those players are is a fascinating and timely concept too. Kristen, there's a really interesting sort of back and forth um, conversation going on about the um, Cleveland Museum of um, Contemporary Art and an exhibition that was supposed to go up about an, by an artist. It was canceled, um, but the new, you know, sort of what you're talking about, the nuance, it, it one of the, or many of the pieces that that the artist Sean Leonard, Leonard, Leonardo was about to mount dealt with the killing of Tamir Rice. Um, and, but it's really interesting, and again, from the museum world, the community anger, the institutional sort of defensiveness, the, the response of Tamir Rice's mother. Um, and so I think it just speaks to what you're talking about, that it's not just the power of telling, but also the power of listening. Um, and how do we sort of build in patience to understand the complexities and nuance of sort of response and emotion. Um, the director ended up resigning for canceling the show, but you know had originally canceled it because they said it was at the community's behest. And so it's been a real argument about who's and it's not any one, it's a number of different voices. So it's just a really interesting um, um, conversation at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Cleveland about this Tamir Rice exhibition. So. That's a great model. So, um, let's see what last slides we have here and then I'm gonna turn it over to you guys. Oh, I wanted to share with you this um, reflection circle um, activity that we've been using with Novas. We, we borrowed it from the, um, this organization in uh, Portland, Oregon. We learned that, about it from the ICEEN group, the um, Independent School for Education, Independent Schools Experiential Education Network. Um, but the, the, there's these community norms. It's a reflection uh, circle. And they use this SOS model which is, um, starts with self. So one word to describe what you're bringing into this circle, a tweet length sensory experience that you're, um, that's sticking with you from your, your, either your experience in your community engagement project or today before we're joining in to, in our Zoom call for class. And then in the third one, we're thinking about what have you noticed about yourself, your others and systems. And it creates this great opportunity. And you know, you, you journal about that before you go in and share and you could have them pair share. You could have them just pick one of the three sentences or you know, questions that they're gonna focus on and they're sharing afterwards. But it grounds you in thinking about yourself, others, and then the systems that are at play. And it helps um, students really start to activate their awareness of systems from the very obvious ones that are in the news like policing and healthcare to the minutia of ones of like um, the, the morning routine to get us out of the house or up to bed or the, the fact that we have a new uh, system that in the, where we all stay in the same house, you know? So it allows us to um, see how these, these things are at play all the time. Kristen, I just wanna say thank you. I was on a call where you talked about that with the NSPP earlier and we actually use it as our, in our school. We called it SOS, so everyone in here to talk about COVID and it was super successful. So it's a great, it's a great tool and it was really easy to implement even though I had only kind of gone through the process once. So it's a really transferable tool. So thanks. Awesome, thank you. Um, 
And then the last thing before we go into to brainstorming and sharing is um, please join us later when you can join us um, for our Savannah program on race, power, and preservation of African American and Gullah Geechee um, history. In the moment we are in the midst of a think tank, we're trying to design this as a virtual experience um, for school groups to be able to use throughout the year. Because I think it's very timely to have some tools or community partners or experiences where we can talk about race, but um, through a historic and um, uh, a firsthand experience. So um, that is, will be revealed. Um, there is, what we're looking at now is having educators model the first kind of couple segments and then we're going to be looking for school groups who might want as their service learning project to help us develop more little modules um, so that they would work with our community partner and maybe do interviews with them and record them so that they would be available for other school groups to use in the spring so if your school community or non-traditional educational community might be interested in partnering with us let me know um, and then we always do one international program with educators too. We were supposed to go to Trinidad this year. I imagine we'll try to go next summer instead as well. Um, so I would like to um, hear from you about any, you know, uh, deep dive questions that you might have. Um, see if Joe has anything he wants to add to. Um, and I, I also thought that this could be a great time for us to, to do some brainstorming about um, where are you in your community engagement journey and what opportunities might be there for deepening or uh, starting new relationships. Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt. Hi. Uh, yeah, I have to go now because I have an, another meeting to attend. And thank you, Kristen. And it's so nice to talking and uh, to everyone. And I hope to maybe to kind of get connected with you sometime later. Yeah, thanks. Bye. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah, bye. Shall I ask, what are you guys doing for community engagement? What have been some of your projects in your pre-COVID lives? So um, one of the things we do is, well, two things. One is we have something called the citizenship project that we're doing with our um, both our APUS and our non-AP classes. Atticus, please leave the room. Sorry. Um, and so it's a year long research project, but it's also, there's supposed to be experiential learning module um, and different kind of aspects of it. Some, some of its oral history is actually in the process of writing my cohort and saying, oh, here's this project that might work. She's from South Carolina. So, um, uh, so that's one of the things we do is, is kind of looking at that and like trying to get kids to think about that like aspect of citizenship they're looking at and how it can connect into um, into like work they do either through community service or on their own. So we haven't quite taken that next step, but that's our kind of goal to take it to the next level this year is to really uh, do that. We did it online and they kind of, they created some amazing pro online projects this year, like museums that they put together and all sorts of different stuff that was, that was really cool. Um, but that's some of what we do beyond the traditional kind of community service piece that I'm always trying to get tied into curriculum um, and club work better. Do you know if your community has been staying in touch with your community service partners? We have, cause I'm doing that, but not necessarily those who reached out through the, that citizenship project, cause those are smaller. Um, we have kind of one or two really main partners that we work with and we've continued to work with them. Actually on my list of things to do is follow up again. Cause I have not seen them for the past month or so and just to check in and figure out what we're doing as far as tutoring and support in the fall. I'll share that uh, I, this is this has been really wonderful, Kristen, and and the dialogue is great. Um, 
you know, those of us that have been involved with, you know, quote unquote service learning for years and years, I, I think at the end of the day, it, it really has all come back around repeatedly and again now to, um, you know, we, we really come back around to the idea of reciprocity. Uh, I mean, for me, there are a lot of ahas that have gone on over the years, but without a deeper grasp and thinking about reciprocity, I think the entire enterprise becomes questionable. And I think that that has come up. I mean, a lot of us have had reservations over the years about service projects. Mm -hmm. and I, Kristen, you said something, even the word service has, it's, it's a loaded term. But I'd be interested in, in how, you know, the folks that are here, including you, Kristen, have, have watched a shift in thinking when, when the idea of reciprocity and, and what that really means in its fullest way begins to be part of the topic of conversation. Have any of you had kind of big experiences with that, with your students, with your colleagues at your schools or locations? I'm going to do Sana and then Jackie. I'll just be really quick. I mean, in the museum world, I think the issue of interpreting collections is an area that has been wide open for sort of making sure that, you know, that when you work with um, objects that are, you're, you know, legally obtained and all of that and respectfully obtained, but even how you present them and the interpretation becomes really important. And the only way you can do that with any uh, real validity is to have a collaboration uh, between the academics, between the folks who care and, and use the objects um, in very different ways than academics do. Um, and I think it's building that respect and building those opportunities. So I've been involved in a lot of projects at museums around the country in Boston and Seattle where, and, and recently at the Brooklyn Historical Society. So I think that's an important aspect that, as you said earlier, museums don't always get it right, but there are some of us who are in museums who are really pushing to, um, because it's also in some cases giving people access to um, kinds of objects and things that they may not have had um, or still not have in their family. So. Are you familiar with the uh, museums as sites for social action toolkit and moment? Yeah, we were doing, we have a group in Savannah. This is a really exciting project. I'd love to see something yeah. modeled. So, yeah, no, I, I've, I've been in the museum world for a very, very long time. So there are very, uh, I mean, not, that there, but there are a lot of people who've been doing this work for a long time and it's sort of exciting that some of it is coming home to roost in new ways um, and changing the ways that people are thinking about how to run these kinds of institutions um, and how to change the leadership. Well, I, and I think that the, what they developed would be useful for K-12s, um, totally. especially if you ever are partnering with the museum. So they, uh, Different players from all over came together, developed like, how do we create more inclusive spaces and, and engagement and it's full of case studies. I think it's just, it's a rich tool to, to dig through as an educator too. And then what they promoted was um, international uh, book groups to work through the, the book together. And so in Savannah, we've established a little group that's um, you know, holding each other accountable and doing the work. Um, Jackie, what did you want to add? Well, I was just going to say, um, in our school, we do have a service learning coordinator. And currently, the model that we're doing falls very short of what I would like to see us do. It's a lot of bring in a jar of this or donate for turkeys for Thanksgiving. Um, you know, sometimes the students go out and help do things like, you know, cradles to crayons or something like that. But they're very much checking off the box. They need X amount of hours. It's a day out of the classroom rather than feeling like an authentic experience where there's any relationships made and connected. Um, in my previous school, I used to teach um, third grade and I had the class plant a garden and they then ha harvested the vegetables and we brought them to the woman's shelter and the kids accompanied me with all of that. And it just felt so good that they saw the fruits of the, you know, they, they till the soil, they saw the fruits of their labor and they actually got to meet the women and kids who were in the shelter. And I just would love for us to be doing something a little bit more like that 
currently um, I feel somewhat unsure of how to make a greater community outreach um, in terms of my own classroom um, my 10th grade curriculum I call hidden voices so we're definitely trying to listen to stories so that the students um, understand those different narratives but then yeah I'm just really looking forward to kind of taking it to the next level and I feel thank you Joe all these workshops have been just super inspiring for me to to that point thanks Jackie and it it's a pro I mean what I would contribute I mean we been doing these these institutes for years and years and years and it, it it's a dialogue it's a process and you know schools I mean my my old uh, metaphor used to be you know you, it's hard to change a tire on a moving vehicle although you know the vehicle still moving this idea of disruption is opportunity I I I'm I'm all over the place here but I I think there is a focus now by a lot of folks out of necessity around the social and emotional well-being of students. There is a social and emotional well-being of teachers um, who are carrying this heavy, heavy load one way or the other, whether you're in a super elite privileged environment or you know, the school for expelled kids in Denver that we work with. That's not what it's called. And I think the moment is now to really begin to think about relationships first. And as much as schools, I'm choosing my words, as much as schools attempt to do that, relationships are not first in, in most cases. Or it's this hit and run kind of thing. We, I've, we've all been guilty of it. I, I've been guilty of it. You know, where you're trying to create experiences for students and you're, you know, crashing along with the school schedule, et cetera. So slowing down and valuing the relationship and creating opportunities, this is where I'm heading, for a faculty or a smaller subset, I'm a big fan of cohorts, we do a lot of that with the Summer Institute, to have a conversation around what one teacher years ago told me, what really matters. And, and kind of stepping back from this, you know, bucket full of, of content, and, you know, gee whiz, the SATs don't matter, who knew? And, and we've got some opportunity here and to reframe things and, and to get like-minded teachers, you know, I'll get off the soapbox in a second, but to get like-minded teachers, you have a lot of company out there, is what I'm trying to say. You know, I've, I've had the privilege, and it is a privilege, of, of meeting a lot of folks like yourself. You know, you may feel isolated in your own environment. Or you may feel like you've got a handful of people who care about what you care about, but I'm telling you, there are a tremendous number of educators all across this country and beyond that know what matters. So now let's show let's show our schools what relationships can really look like in a in a kind of a project-based curriculum situation. And, and reframe things so they're really about relationships. Anyway, I, I you know, went in five different directions here. I'm, I'm saying the reciprocity piece, relationships, human <clears throat> connection. Seems to me that's what we want to focus on now. And I imagine that depending mm -hmm. on your teaching context, that when you go back, your students are going to have lots of questions about uh, race relations in the United States and what their role is and how they're fitting into that puzzle and this particular moment that we're in and why this particular moment and and what do I do and I um, the that's where our biggest opportunity is right now right and and um, and this is where uh, reciprocity is key right so we don't need to be the white savior to come in and say okay community I'm here to, to help and save it's about listening there's an organization called Standing Up for Racial Justice, SURGE is what they call the acronym, it has chapters all over the US and um, what they are are groups of um, white people in the US who are on their own journey of anti-racism. Uh, they are to support one another so they don't have to ask people of color to, to uh, inform them or help them along the way. Uh, and they are, they prepare themselves to be activated when uh, communities of color need their support. 
And so uh, that's a great chapter to go and connect with um, for your own personal journey, but also um, to, you know, just be ours and Savannah is fairly new and they have a, um, a Facebook page. So I'm always in the loop about what um, marches or things are being planned by the black community here. Uh, but I get it through my, my search chapter. Um, <clears throat> so thinking about, how, you know, where do we create opportunities for listen? Where are, where are opportunities to listen already in existence, especially in this virtual space? There's a lot of town halls that have been held. Um, if there's a neighborhood that you work for a food pantry in that particular neighborhood, then what's going on in that neighborhood? What are the town, those town hall meetings? What is, what's going on with them? Um, and finding, you know, one of the best ways you could do this is to find organizations to, to support or introduce the idea of policy change, right? With your students, how does policy change happen? What is the, the role of voting and, um, uh, and, you know, and then youth power is amazing. You want media attention, you give a whole bunch of youth writing their own press releases and doing the interviews. You'll get them on the TV right away. And so I like to remind kids that they have a lot of power that kind of evaporates in these in-between years for a while, right? But while they're really young, you um, take advantage of that, that novice of, of the experience and the exposure. Oh, it, it's absolutely true. It's absolutely true. I mean, they're, they're, I've seen it at the, what Chris is talking about. I've seen it at the, you know, smallest scale possible at a rural school that you've never heard of in Vermont where I taught and kids capturing the imagination of people, newspapers, et cetera. But on the other hand, you take it to the other extreme and you've got the kids at Marjorie Stoneman. And I, I don't think the kids at Marjorie Stoneman were an aberration at all. I mean, it, it was a big, horrific event, but I, I was watching a film the other night and there they were again. Okay, maybe they faded from the public eye for the moment, but they showed us huge opportunity. And you remember those, those public gatherings across the United States and there was, there was a girl from, young student from South Central in Los Angeles here. And, you know, I don't know how many of you saw that she she spoke and it so in other words it's not just emma gonzalez you know everybody know emma gonzalez from marjorie stoneman you know she's she's not unique and that that's i think the whole point that that there, there are people andy warhol's 15 minutes of fame that emerge to some kind of public persona but they're not unique and and students are you know just waiting for an opportunity, even if they don't know they're waiting for an opportunity to make a big difference. And when they feel it, 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 it bites for life, I think. So well, the, the Brooklyn Friends School had come to do our Savannah program. Yeah, Natanya, that's. Natanya, right before um, Ahmaud Avery was murdered. And so um, the, um, you know, Run for Ahmaud Justice Committee was looking for interns. And I said, well, let's go ask the, the Brooklyn Friends School, if they had, it was the whole 11th grade class had come to the community. And, um, so there were four of them that were really interested and they designed a panel conversation with Ahmad's um, uh, cousin, a lawyer, his, um, his brother and his best friend and his coach from high school. And the students organized the questions, they facilitated, they had over 2,500 people register and uh, over a thousand attend. And, and say that um, number again, Kristen, they had, 2,500 people attend, and this is a couple of high school students who organized this. I attended um, that. It was actually one of the most powerful experiences I've had, just to hear these folks intimately talking about a person. You know, it was extremely moving, and I'm, I'm, I still get their notices, and, and they're, I followed them, you know, to try to see what they're doing, but that was overwhelmingly impressive in just so many different ways. And the amount of agency, so we Novus interviewed the students afterwards and we have a, um, on our website, our blog has a, uh, a, you know, their their answers to our questions. The amount of agency that they felt to be a part of that. And think about like the logistics of coordinating that, they had, you know, their service learning community engagement director supporting setting up the zoom call and facilitating some of the conversations but it was very little facilitator power and very little actually that the students had to do but to create this amazingly powerful 
event. Um, and it was uh, fostered through community connection. Like, what, you know, where are the, the stories and opportunities? And, and people are so hungry to come together that there's so many rich ways that we could um, allow students to be connectors for us right now. I just think of our district um, is looking like it's gonna go online again and I have a fifth grader and a new, oh, she'll be preschooler. And I, and, and, but I, my college is saying that we're going back to teach. Um, and I'm thinking about, I would really love it if there was some high schoolers who wanted to tutor my, it would just have a little bit of FaceTime with my kid. It would be an enormous, and I have lots of uh, privileged time to make that happen. Uh, Sarah, what did you want to add? I was just going to say, like, thinking about this opportunity of disruption and like what's going on in student voice is that like, Hopefully, I think this has been true of our school, but um, a lot of the independent schools, and it's happening, I'm on the board of education in my district as well, and it's happening certainly in our district, which is like very, very white, um, but still um, is a kind of the black at phenomenon now, and that, th that those, you know, starting as Instagram accounts and what have you, is like a really good opportunity to actually like empower kids to like seek change and to make change and to kind of force I mean, I guess to the earlier conversation of like administrators, like getting it, like you don't really have a choice to get it when the news is showing up because you're having a rally on your front doorstep. Now our rally was like supported by the school as well, but like our students who are mostly black females um, who definitely don't get hurt enough, not only organize like calls beforehand, um, but then organize a whole petition, which many people are doing. Like that agency is really happening with kids. And I, I see it consistently, even over the past, I don't know, 10 years of teaching um, that students, they don't feel like they shouldn't do that, right? Like, I feel like in my high school, it's like, oh, you're not, you're not supposed to do that yet. And granted, I grew up in the South. New Orleans is like very different kind of, and I was a faculty kid, so I had to be careful. So there's like lots of stuff to unpack there. But I feel like all of our kids think that they ha can and make a difference or that like they see others doing it. So I really hope that, you know, everyone, wherever we are, can help leverage those movements and that energy. Cause it's like, you can't really say, no, that didn't happen when someone's in front of you saying like, this is a thing that happened to me, you know? So it's a really good opportunity. Just thinking about like, besides COVID, other things that are happening with this like moment of opportunity to disrupt and not quite burn it all down, but maybe a little bit. <laughs> That's when us as facilitators and like um, read bell hooks, or you know what I mean? Like uh, they, they are sparking their own interests uh in the best way of education so how can we give them addition you know doing more of that pivoting like widening what they're seeing is happening and more context more history and layers um so they can you know uh sustain and i really agree with the point that you made and i have been thinking of it so much myself that this year in front of us presents like the most amazing of opportunities for the educational community to actually do some really thoughtful, intentional, purposeful work. And we can get outside our traditional boxes because we're not gonna be in those traditional boxes. And I hate to think this year might get squandered in trying to do a model that we thought worked in the classroom, but it sounds like we collectively in this group know that wasn't a great model to be with at the beginning. And we're gonna try and replicate that online rather than really make it be a meaningful year for students, which we have the opportunity to do. And I would love for our older kids to be connecting with younger students. And the most important thing is to make sure there's a device and a hotspot for every kid in America going into this year so that it can be an equitable opportunity for all. So I really wish all this energy that is draining for us teachers going through these crazy I don't know how to respond to that. Ooh, sorry, <laughs> that was <laughs> right there. Sorry. Yeah, right, yeah. So anyway, I won't keep going, but it just seems like we're on the precipice of this amazing opportunity, and I just worry as, as to how it will roll out for us all. Well, you know, someone, that's great, Jackie, because someone said, I think it was relative to business, but it rang true for me, and those of you who are know who you are. Some, some of us uh, respond to, to chaos in a certain way. And, and I think essentially the comment was about the business community, restaurants or whatever. Those who do well with chaos are really gonna thrive right now. And you could, I'm not sure you wanna make that your school slogan, but there's, there's a great truth in that. 
And this is an opportunity, whether you call it chaos, disruption, and I really think we need to go through the, the, the door, the window, whatever the metaphor is, um, because it won't, it won't last. And the, the schools with the greatest equity issues, um, you know, I, have, I have people in mind, administrators and teachers, that they, there's no way they want to go back to whatever was normal in the old paradigm. Um, I need to be respectful of our time and, and bring us to a smooth closing. And I wanted to share some resource opportunities with you. And I guess I'll, I'll start by thanking Kristen for, you know, the great thing that she brought to us today. Thank you, Kristen, for your time, for your energy and all the great work you do. And, and it's just been a, you know, really rewarding experience to Thank you so much. have you with us. And, Hopefully we'll do this again. Um, we're, we're starting to think about fall seminar opportunities, but I'm, I'm gonna share a couple of quick slides with you because we've got recordings of, um, let's bring this up. Yeah, we've got recordings of many of the workshops that we've done. So hopefully you all have that on your screen. Um, might not be today, but within the next day or so, we will have um, this workshop up and ready to be accessed. These are on our YouTube channel. So if you go to YouTube and search communityworksinstitute.org, you can find our channel. Um, there, there also are a lot of folks to meet. We have a Voices and Educators series that you could skim through, and, and I think you'll meet a lot of very like-minded educators there sharing their, their thoughts. Um, I'm going to run through a sampling. Um, these are just some of the workshops we've done in the last, what is it, four months now? Time has flown. Um, Jennifer, she's a great teacher from Bakersfield, California. Uh, very much about Google Classroom, writer projects and collaboration, and she gives real examples. Um, if that's new to you, I think you'll find it a great resource, both Google Classroom and the way that Jennifer and Google educators utilize it. Um, I ate a, a, a colleague. Sorry, so we can see these on the YouTube channel. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah. These are all on the YouTube channel. Okay. They, they range from 30 some minutes to an hour. Thank uh, you. Yep. Um, merging meditative music and art. These were all an attempt to, you know, provide different kinds of ways of approaching the virtual, the digital reality that we're, we're facing. Um, and this, I, I don't know how many of you have seen True Justice, but we're, we're you know, really honored to be partnering with the Kuhnhart Film Foundation who produced True Justice, um, the story of Brian Stevenson. Um, he's, he's just an amazing leader, for lack of another word. I mean, he's, he's got an inspiring personal story. You can find it on HBO. Um, I highly recommend watching it. Um, it streams for free off and on. But that workshop as well would be a great opportunity to see students from two, several completely different socioeconomic groups coming together around race and justice. I think you'll definitely find it inspiring. Um, you'll see the, the reaction these students have to their experience. Um, Darren Early, I can never say enough about, um, did a seminar for us last week. Um, Darren, myself, and others really think we don't want um, another art-related workshop um, that you'll enjoy, I think, with uh, Juliana Ostrowski from our partners at Otis College of Art and Design. Um, our own sonnet, Takahisa and her colleagues from the Brooklyn Historical Society, really um, rich workshop and project that you can dig deeper and deeper into. I'll let you comment if you want sonnet. Uh, I, would love it if you'd comment. This is a very rich project, an oral history project that's so much more. Want to say anything about it before we move uh, on? It's, it's on two levels. I mean, it's one sort of some of the things that uh, we were talking about before about what's missing in some of the official yeah. narratives. So this was an attempt to gather stories about Muslims whose stories are not told um, very much, but it's also um, the website, which will go up at the end of August, will also talks about how do you use oral histories in the classroom both not just not just creating oral histories which many teachers do but
but also the act of listening and paying attention. Yeah. Really, really exceptionally rich resource. Another workshop uh, looking at, uh, you know, the relationship between love and education and why that really ought to be at the center. Um, one of our other partners, the Smithsonian Digital Learning Lab, um, we can't say enough about it. It's a bottomless rabbit hole of opportunity, digital resources. I think the number was five million or higher. I mean, it, it, if you know anything about the Smithsonian, you know that they have a tremendously large collection and so much of it has been digitized and you can access that and create collections and this is a primer workshop to get you started. Um, Narrative 4, another partner of ours, um, using stories to build empathy, break down stereotypes and barriers. So these were all recordings. I guess that one's in there twice. And last but not least, our amazing colleague Lisa Falk um, has done several different workshops for us and she will be a part of our Summer Institute team, as will several of the other folks you've met here. Stories, objects hold and inspire. Um, so these are great workshops. Summer Institute's July 27th to the 31st, and then August 10th to the 14th, whichever fits best for you. And we have fall seminar series coming up at a Winter Institute. So that brings us to a closing. And I just want to stop sharing and, and thank all of you for making the time. Um, so this isn't the, be, you know, the end, it's a beginning. And hopefully we'll see some of you at the Summer Institute and then towards the end of August, a uh, startup fall series. Any closing quick comments before we adjourn? I was just trying to type this into the chat, but I'm a slow typist. No. I just want to say thank you so much, Kristen. Every single thing we talked about today has energized me in a way that I just, I just don't think I'm going to leave this table for quite some time. Um, but in general, Joe, um, these, this summer series has been really some of the best. I don't even know if I can call it professional development because it's so much more than that. But it's been, I've been teaching for a long, long time. And I've done lots of different workshops and seminars and things. And I just really value the work that you're doing. I can't wait to explore the website. And um, there was a little weird glitch. So I missed the second in the series of four. So I'm happy that that's, you might remember someone had forgotten to record oh, my registration. Yes. And that's there were a couple of folks who missed that one. Uh, so I'm thrilled to be able to come back and do that. But just the work you are all doing is unbelievable and it touches so much that I have tried to do in my teaching and I feel like you are going to allow me to go from that like I keep feeling like I'm throwing strands of pasta against the wall to see if it sticks and I'm trying this and I'm trying that and you know I think I have tools now to move towards something more substantive and sustained you know not just like oh I'll try this I'll do this oral history project I'll do this service learning I'll teach social justice, you know, it's like, I feel like I can take it and really create something more cohesive for my students. So thank you a million times. Yeah. That, that's our goal. And, and I have to tell you, it, you know, I'm, I'm humbled by it. I really do mean that, but I've been at this for a long time. We won't count years. And the, the folks who are still involved with this process after decades who kind of come back, they disappear, they come back. And I hope that we will all continue to connect uh, because every single one of you has something to contribute. I always say that and I mean it. And Kristen, thank you so much for the great work you did and for being here with us today. Thank you. I, I get lonesome in Savannah, so call me anytime when you're ready to brainstorm, everyone. Oh, my goodness. Thank, thank you, you so, so much. much. I really thank appreciate much. it all. Thank you. It was wonderful. Thank you. We'll talk soon, Kristen. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Thanks all. Likewise, all. Thank you, Kristen. Bye, everyone. Hey, Cynthia. Hey, it was great. I want to come nice. to Vermont. You have no idea. <laughs> <laughs>